Good morning. Oh, I don't know that I got a huge amount of sleep last night. I had my beautiful little granddaughter sleep over, and of course she sleeps in Nanny and Papa's bed. Um, so I didn't get a lot of sleep, but it was such a, a, a pleasure to have her. We had so much fun. We played. And my husband, Pucky, some of you may know, he's um, kept all of our kids' toys from when they were like really little and keeps them immaculately. Um, there's a little bit of OCD in my husband, but I'm grateful for that. And um, so we actually got these big, big boxes out of all the old toys that her mum had played with when she was a little girl. And the joy. We had so much fun. Nanny, nanny, come play with me. <laughs> it was good. So really, really good fun. So today um, I want to talk about be aware of who you really are. I think we've all touched on it through worship this morning, through, you know, our giving, through what Sabina said, being aware of who you really are. And um, I'm going to start with Genesis 127. It says, so God created me in his image. In the image of God, he created him, man, male and female. Verse 31 says, then God, God saw that he, ha- sorry, he saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. Very good. Turn to your neighbour and say, you're very good. In fact, I think that if God created us in his image, I think we're, we're almost more than very good. I think we're pretty awesome. So maybe turn to your neighbour and say, actually, I think you're pretty awesome. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so is that how you really see yourself? Yeah. Have a think about that. Is that how you really see yourself? Awesome. Created in God's image. Yeah. And you have a, an absolutely glorious treasure living within. How can we not be awesome exactly? <laughs> Be aware of who you really are. And I think it all begins with an understanding of self. Who you are, whose you are, and what you believe about this. Pastor Henry was talking about having our guest speaker in a couple of weeks. And um, it's so it's so important that we get this. It's so important that we are fully equipped to help people. You know, most of my work with Act for Kids, we're working with people that suffer from some sort of mental health and it limits and and stops people from doing anything that they really want to do well. So we need to understand it and we need to understand who we are and who lives within us and draw that out of others as well so that we can bring people up to a new place. Just a new place of self-awareness, a new place of who they are in Christ, who they are in themselves. So I think it's our job to remind ourselves daily, I am a child of God. I have the Holy Spirit living within me. I am the temple. No longer does God live in churches, he lives in us. It's so um, prevalent, it's so beautiful when you really think about it. And we all know this, but getting it deep in our spirit is what we need to do. Just get that real deep understanding of who you really are, because you're pretty awesome. (laughs) Second Corinthians um, also reminds us about being humble, because uh, chapter 4 verse 7 says, We are like common clay jars that carry this glorious treasure within so that the extraordinary overflow of power will be seen as God's, not ours. So when we start to really operate in who we are in God, he gets the glory. People benefit from it, but he gets the glory And when we carry this beautiful treasure within us, we'll overflow with his love because God is love. 
And what does the, need, the world need most right now? Yeah. What do, you know, fatherless children need right now? Love. And they need, you know, people that believe in them. We can't help but flow with love when we have love living within us. It's so beautiful. <laughs> Be the rivers of overflowing love. And knowing who you really are is a true key to walking in the freedom and bringing heaven to earth. It's our job to bring heaven to earth. His kingdom come. His will be done. It's not about getting people to heaven. It's about bringing heaven to earth. Yeah? If we struggle with our true identity, we struggle with loving ourselves and loving others. Knowing who you really are is paramount to living your best life. Living in peace, living in freedom, and living confidently in who you are. Living confidently in your own skin. Yeah? And, you know, if we've lived long enough, and we all here have, <laughs> I think, <laughs> um, I want to live longer, but, you know, we know that storms come. It's not always smooth sailing. It could be things going on in your own personal life. It could be in your family. It could be in your workplace. It could be in society. Troubles come and troubles go. We know that. But it's how you see this and how you see yourself and how you carry yourself that determines how you really ride the storms, isn't it? John 14, 27 says, Peace be with you. I give you my own peace. This is not the kind the world gives. People are seeking peace everywhere, aren't they? This peace is in the midst of troubled times. Therefore, having nothing to fear, let not your hearts be timid. And this year we're talking about live, love and leading well, aren't we? And I'm sure we're all doing that really, really well. But I want to remind us um, through a story in the Bible today about how Jesus did this. And um, this, this story is a, a beautiful story. We all know, we probably all know it and, and, and it's been preached on millions of times over the years but I want to read it again because it just really touched my heart a lot. And I've just actually watched a little bit of The Chosen again. And I just love the way that that video series brings life to Jesus and brings normality and brings sort of that beautiful fullness of life. And um, the story I'm going to read is in John 8 verse 14. And I think Ian will put that up so you can follow. Um, and I'm going to read it out of the um, uh, Passion Translation. But before I do that, there's a couple of other things I wanted to remind us. And, and think of this as I read the story, right? There's two things. One is um, what Jesus says in this story to some of the religious leaders, the Pharisees and other religious leaders, and that's found in John 8, verse 14. He says, I absolutely know who I am, where I've come from, and where I'm going. That's the words of Jesus. Do you? Do you know who you are, where you've come from, and where you're going? Good question, isn't it? And the second thing I want us to remember as um, we read this little story here is um, found in John 1 verse 17. It, it says, Moses gave us the law, but Jesus, the anointed one, unveils truth wrapped in tender mercy. Truth. <laughs> wrapped in tender mercy. How beautiful is that? 
And Romans 6 verse 14 talks about sin being your master while you were under the law. So when sin was your master, the law was your measure. Now grace rules. The law revealed your slavery to sin. Now grace reveals your freedom from it. So when Jesus walked the earth, grace just flowed, didn't it? His beautiful grace and that truth wrapped in tender mercy. So I'm going to start from John chapter 1, and I'm going to read right through to probably about verse 16, but I'll stop and start a little bit. Are you ready for it? It's the adulterous woman forgiven. It's titled in my Bible. In my Bible. Jesus walked up to the Mount of Olives near the city where he spent the night. Then at dawn, Jesus appeared in the temple courts again. And soon all the people gathered around and listened to his words. So he sat down and taught them. Don't forget Jesus was a rabbi, so he was able to teach in the temple courts. Then in the middle of his teaching, the religious scholars and the Pharisees broke through the crowd and brought a woman who had been caught in the act of committing adultery and made her stand in the middle of everyone. How humiliating. How rude <laughs> of those religious leaders to do that. But in that day, remember, they were living in the law. Yeah? And they had the right to do that. We all sort of often wonder why they didn't bring the bloke as well. But anyway, not going to go there today. <laughs> Then they said to Jesus, Teacher, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Doesn't Moses' law command us to stone to death a woman like this? Tell us, what do you say we should do with her? They were all only testing Jesus because they hoped to trap him with his own words and accuse him of breaking the law of Moses. But Jesus didn't answer them. Instead, he simply bent down and wrote in the dust with his finger. Angry, they kept insisting that he answer their questions. So Jesus stood up and looked at them and said, Let's have the man who has never had a sinful desire throw the first stone at her. That's pretty bold, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> could have had a few religious people say, I've never sinned. <laughs> But Jesus, he knew. He knew. <sighs> and then he bent down again and he wrote something in the words of the dust. Upon hearing that, her accusers slowly left the crowd one at a time, beginning with the oldest to the youngest, with a convicted conscience. Until finally... Jesus was left alone with the woman, still standing there in front of him. So he stood back up and he said to her, Dear woman, where are your accusers? Is there no one here to condemn you? Looking around, she replied, I see no one, Lord. Then Jesus said to her, Then certainly, then I certainly don't condemn you either. Go from now on and be free from a life of sin. Go from now on and be free from a life of sin. I love those finishing words there. Then I certainly don't condemn you. Now, I, I struggle at, at time to time with that whole sort of judgment thing. <laughs> Am I the only one? <laughs> like, because, you know, when you work with very vulnerable people, when you work with drug addicts, you know, when you work with people that are putting maybe themselves first before their children, it's so easy to... And you work with that day in, day out. It's so easy to sort of just get this little attitude going. <laughs> and so 
I think that's what led me to read this story because it's just so important that we don't, we're not a judge, we're a jury. We're called to love. And in, in our society, it's just so easy. Like, you know, you get broken into by a youth offender and it's just so easy to, oh, that little mongrel or whatever you want to call them. <laughs> it's so easy to judge because you've been offended, you're hurt, you're upset, you're cranky, you know. But I think it's just important. That's something for me. I don't know about you, but for me, I have to remind myself daily in my work, uh, no judging. There's no judgment here. You know, and it, it, it sometimes is a struggle. But I just love that that story really, um, really emphasises that. There's no judgment in Christ. He came to heal, to set free. And I love the way he just says, from now on be free from a life of sin. And then he goes on to talk about, um, talk to the Pharisees and to the crowd. And I'm just going to read uh, verses 12 to 16. And it's, it's actually titled, Jesus, the light of the world. Then Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And those who embrace me will experience life-giving light. And they will never walk in darkness. The Pharisees were immediately offended and said, You're just boasting about yourself. Since we only have your word on this, it makes your testimony invalid. But remember, I, re I read those um, scriptures and I told you to keep them in mind about who Jesus is. He knows who he is. He, he, he knows who's with him. Yeah. And then the, the law of Moses, that there needed to be two people to make the judgment, basically. And Jesus responded... Just because I am the one making these claims doesn't mean that they're invalid, for I absolutely know who I am, where I've come from and where I'm going. But you, Pharisees, have no idea about what I'm saying, for you have set yourselves up as judges of others, based on outward appearances. But I certainly never judge others in that way, for I discern the truth. And that's that scripture truth wrapped in tender mercy and I am not alone in my judgments for my father and I have the same understanding in all things and he has sent me to you and he goes on to say isn't it written in the law of Moses that the testimony of two men is trustworthy then what I say about who I am is true for I am not alone in my testimony my father is the other witness and we testify together of this truth and they went on sort of taunting him or who is this father and where is he basically but you know knowing who you are how important is that knowing who you are God's grace and mercy always seems to floor the religious yeah <laughs> let's live a life free of judgment So in wrapping up my message today, if we are called to live, love and lead well, which I believe we truly are, then this is made possible because the truth wrapped in tender mercy lives within me, lives within you, makes it possible. Jesus takes us from sin consciousness to grace and freedom from sin. So let's love tenderly as Jesus did, be kind to yourselves and others, be considerate, graceful, respectful, forgiving. And I think this is the scripture that Sabina spoke of this morning, uh, Psalms 92 verse 2, at each and every sunrise, we will be thanking you for your kindness and your love as the sun sets and all throughout the night, we will keep proclaiming you are faithful. Yeah? You are faithful. So live a life of thankfulness. In Christ we live and move and have our being. And let's be all good stewards of what he's given us, what he's blessed us with, our bodies, our families, 
our spirit, our mind, our land, our seas, everything around us, our treasures, our talents. Let's be thankful and bless others with what he's given us. We're called to lead by example. And I really believe that story in John is a great story for us to keep in mind when we're living and leading by his example. Jesus never showed judgment. He always showed love in action. Okay. We're going to come around communion. So if those that are giving out the communion emblems could come. And um, while I was preparing for this message over the last few weeks, I, um, Pastor Helen gave me this great Gospel of John in the Mirror Study Bible. And, oh man, it's amazing. I can hardly get past the first few chapters. <laughs> it's so thick and full. So I want to just read from that translation, um, John chapter 6, verse 57 and 58, as we take communion this morning. John 6 says, and you know what, this is, this is a scripture that sort of follows that my flesh is food and it's the truest form and my blood is drink um, and it's the truest form. You know, for you, I don't know about you, but for years I've, I've read those scriptures and not got it. <laughs> Just like, oh, he's talking about eating his flesh and drink, you know, like... I don't know, I've always just wanted to find the real spiritual root meaning for that, you know, like I just, you know, can, can you imagine if you've never been to church before and you came into a church and someone started saying we're eating his, you know, <laughs> flesh and drinking of his blood, it, it's sort of weird, isn't it? So when I read this, I was just like, oh, that's a beautiful revelation, you know, like, Even though I sort of got it, I got it more after reading this. It says, As the living Father has sent me and also sustains me, so will I sustain the one eating me. I live through my Father, just like my daily food sustains me, so his life permanently resides in me. Now you may also continually and habitually feast on me and live through me. Verse 58, this is the bread that stepped down out of the heavenly sphere. There is no comparison with the manna your fathers received from heaven, which was merely a prophetic shadow pointing to me. They ate and they died without completing their destiny. Now feast on me and celebrate the life of the ages. And then it goes on to talk about In the footnotes, eating and drinking is most significant. Every meal is both a reminder and a celebration of the incarnation. (coughs) Every time we face food, we are reminded of our beingness in flesh and our seamless oneness with our maker and with one another. The prophetic picture of the table was a very strategic in the tent of the tabernacle in the wilderness. The priests had to daily place fresh bread on the table in the sanctuary. It was called the showbread. Face bread or bread of the presence. Isn't that beautiful? The moment we discover Jesus in scripture as a mirror, our hearts ignite and our very next meal becomes a celebration of our incarnate incarnate union every step you eat and sorry every time you eat and drink which we're going to do now remember me every meal celebrates the temple your body is God's address on planet earth and I think I might finish with that yeah I like this little part too Feast your mind on likeness, realities. Make deity your diet. Digest me. Face your father. Isn't that beautiful? (laughs) All right, let's take these emblems today. 
and feast. Let's feast on who we are, who we really are in Christ. Who we really are. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just pray today that you would just give us a fresh revelation of who we hold within, who we really are in you. And every time we eat and every time we drink of this bread and the wine, we're reminded that we are your temple and we ingest you today. We, we enjoy every moment of living free in you. In Jesus' name, take, eat and drink. Amen.